Uh, good evening, everyone. And apologies for doing this uh, so late. Hope I'm not disrupting people's dinner plans. Uh, we just finished um, a marathon day at the G20. We came together to focus on solving some of the most consequential problems affecting people of our nations and the world. Uh, and let me begin by thanking our host, India, for setting out an ambitious agenda for this meeting and for its presidency of the G20. Uh, we met here in Delhi roughly one year after President Putin launched his war of aggression on Ukraine, and one week after 141 countries voted in the United Nations General Assembly for a resolution that expresses support for a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in accordance with the United Nations Charter and its principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, and deplores the human rights and humanitarian consequences of Russia's aggression. Not a single G20 member voted with Russia to oppose that resolution. The chair's statement by India today reaffirmed the declaration issued by the G20 leaders last year in Bali, which, and I quote, strongly condemned the war in Ukraine and stressed it as causing immense human suffering and exacerbating existing fragilities in the global economy, end quote. Russia and China were the only two countries that made clear that they would not sign on to that text. 18 members of the G20 also reaffirmed that it is, and I quote, essential to uphold international law in the multilateral system. This includes defending all of the purposes and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations and adhering to international humanitarian law, end quote. Every G20 member, and virtually every country, period, continues to bear the costs of Russia's war of aggression, a war that President Putin could end tomorrow if he chose to do so. The United States didn't want this war. We worked hard to prevent it. Like most countries, we want to focus on the fundamental challenges affecting the daily lives of our people. So even as we stand with Ukraine while it defends itself, as any nation would do in that position, we're also determined to keep working with other countries to deliver solutions to these shared challenges. And that's exactly what we did today at the G20. These challenges include the unprecedented food security crisis around the world. Uh, we've got to do two things at once. Get food to the hungry now, but also help countries build up their agricultural productivity and resilience so that they're less vulnerable to future shocks. The United States is leading on both fronts. In addition to funding more than half of the World Food Program's entire budget, we've contributed $13.5 billion to fight hunger over the last year alone. And we've committed more than $11 billion over the next five years to boost countries' resilience and nutrition. African countries in particular have told us time and again that more than aid, what they want is help building the sustainable capacity to feed their own people. And we're teaming up to do just that. Now, the unprecedented levels of food insecurity have been driven primarily by, by climate, by COVID, and by conflicts. But the crisis has been worsened intentionally by President Putin, who's weaponized the hunger of people across the globe. Thanks in large part to UN Secretary General Guterres and Turkey. Uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative loosened Russia's stranglehold on Ukraine's ports, allowing more than 22 million metric tons of grain and other food. That's the equivalent of 8 billion loaves of bread to leave Ukraine's ports for global markets. And that's lowered the price of food for people everywhere. Today, Russia is again slow walking the export of food from Ukraine. And with the Black Sea Initiative set to expire on March 18th, Russia has refused to commit to renewing it. The message that countries said at today's meeting is clear. Extend the Black Sea Grain Initiative and strengthen it, and do that without delay. We also discussed ways to counter the proliferation and trafficking of illicit synthetic drugs like fentanyl and methamphetamine. In the United States alone, fentanyl killed more than 70,000 people uh, last year. It's the number one killer of Americans aged 18 to 49. No country can tackle this problem alone, disrupting supply chains of precursors, preventing the diversion of legal chemicals to illegal uses, dismantling the transnational criminal groups that foster corruption and profit off their other suffering. These are challenges that demand a coordinated global effort. And that's why it's important that, for the first time, G20 ministers called for a strong international cooperation to counter illicit synthetic drugs. And it's why I propose to my fellow ministers today at the G20 that we create a focused line of effort 
to bring together governments, international and regional organizations, private sectors, and others to tackle this problem. This is a law enforcement and security issue, but it's fundamentally a public health issue and an increasingly global one. Today we also discussed other challenges where people around the globe expect our countries to work together, like addressing the climate crisis, helping communities adapt to the inevitable changes it's causing, strengthening global health security so that we're better prepared to prevent, detect, and respond to future health emergencies. I also had the opportunity to speak on the margins of today's meetings uh, with uh, counterparts from Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, the Netherlands, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, and of course, India. And let me first commend the Indian Presidency and Foreign Minister Jai Shankar for securing G20 consensus on a broad set of agreements reflected in the Chair's summary and outcome document. That's a first for G20 foreign ministers. Now, Minister Jai Shankar and I speak so frequently that uh, we just pick up right where we left off, uh, working to elevate our strategic partnership in concrete ways supporting India's very ambitious G20 agenda, advancing the U.S.-India initiative on critical and emerging technology, which President Biden and Prime Minister Modi launched at the G20 summit in Bali last May, engaging our shared commitment to human rights and democratic values. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Foreign Minister and I will join our counterparts from Japan and Australia for a meeting of the Quad, where key areas of focus will include protecting the free and unrestricted movement of goods and people across our seas, and boosting cooperation against uh, around humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, the importance of which has been brought once again into sharp relief by the devastating earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Our engagement with the Quad uh, and the G20 are just a few of the examples of how the United States is weaving together alliances and partnerships to enhance our capacity to deliver for our citizens. Uh, that's why I began this trip uh, in Central Asia, where I joined my counterparts for the C5 plus one ministerial. Uh, the more of these partnerships that we build, strengthen, and stitch together, the more we're able to effectively tackle uh, transnational challenges that affect our people, broaden opportunities for Americans, bolster our security, and advance our interests. And what we're seeing in Delhi and Astana and Tashkent and beyond is that countries want to partner with the United States because they see us showing up to solve shared problems, fostering inclusive economic growth, investing in our own competitiveness and standing up for the international rules of the road that benefit all countries, including the right of every country to choose its own path free from violence, coercion, and threats. Uh, lastly, I spoke briefly with Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, on the margins of our G20 meeting today. I urged Russia to reverse its irresponsible decision and return to implementing the New START Treaty which places verifiable limits on the nuclear arsenals of the United States and the Russian Federation. Mutual compliance is in the interest of both our countries. It's also what people around the world expect from us as nuclear powers. I told the foreign minister that no matter what else is happening uh, in the world or in our relationship, the United States will always be ready to engage and act on strategic arms control, just as the United States and the Soviet Union did even at the height of the Cold War. I also raised the wrongful detention of Paul Whelan, as I have on many previous occasions. The United States has put forward a serious proposal. Moscow should accept it. We're determined to bring Paul and every other American citizen who is unjustly detained around the world home. We won't rest until we do. Finally, uh, I told the foreign minister uh, what I and so many others said last week at the United Nations and what so many G20 foreign ministers said today, end this war of aggression. Engage in meaningful diplomacy that can produce a just and durable peace. President Zelensky has put forward a 10-point plan for a just and durable peace. The United States stand ready to support Ukraine through diplomacy to end the war on this basis. President Putin, however, has demonstrated zero interest in engaging, saying there's nothing to even talk about unless and until Ukraine accepts, and I quote, the new territorial realities, while doubling down on his brutalization of Ukraine. Independent of what Russia does, we showed here in Delhi what we will do, deliver results on the problems most affecting our people's lives. Our hosts are committed to doing this over the course of their G20 presidency. For that, and for their leadership and hospitality, 
I'd like to close by expressing my gratitude to India. And with that, happy to take some questions. We'll first go to Ian Marlowe with Bloomberg. Thank you, Secretary. Um, there's been rising concerns uh, in recent years about democratic backsliding and human rights issues in India, including the rights of religious minorities, and recently with a move against the news, or, nor, news organization, the BBC. Uh, did you raise U.S. concerns about these issues with your Indian counterpart today, and are you concerned at all that the situation might worsen heading into next year's federal election in India? Uh, and secondly, Reuters has reported that the U.S. is speaking with allies about potential sanctions for China if it sends lethal aid uh, to Russia uh, for use in Ukraine, as, as you've warned about in the past. Uh, can you comment at all on those discussions uh, and more broadly about your conversations with counterparts today relating to China's relationship with uh, Moscow? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, on India, uh, we're the world's two biggest democracies. Uh, we're committed to an enduring project, uh, both of us. Uh, in our case, as our founders put it, striving to form a more perfect union. Uh, that's part of our national ethos. Uh, it's a project for both of us, uh, India and the United States, in different but also uh, complementary ways. So we have to work together to show that our democracies can actually deliver uh, on our people's needs, and we have to continue to hold ourselves to our core values including respect for universal human rights, like freedom of religion and belief, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, which makes our democracy stronger. So we regularly engage with our Indian counterparts to encourage the Indian government to uphold its own commitments to protect human rights, just as uh, we look to ourselves to do the same thing. And uh, in, in most conversations that I have with, um, with my counterpart, Foreign Minister Ayesha Shankar, uh, this is uh, an issue that we discussed again as we did, uh, as we did today. Um, with regard to China and uh, its support for Russia's aggression in Ukraine, as we've said from the start, and as President Biden made very clear to President Xi, uh, going back to the very beginning of the Russian aggression, uh, were China to engage in material, lethal support for Russia's aggression, uh, or were to engage in a systematic evasion of sanctions uh, to help Russia, that would be a serious problem for, uh, for our countries. When I saw uh, senior foreign policy official Wang Yi uh, on the margins of the Munich uh, meetings just a week or so ago, I raised with him our very real concern that, based on information we have, China is considering supplying lethal military assistance to Russia. We've not seen it do that yet. But we've seen it considering that proposition. And what I shared with him again uh, was that this would be a serious problem for us in our relationship with China. And I made clear that there would be consequences for engaging in those actions. Uh, so I'm not going to detail uh, what they would be. But of course, we have sanctions authorities uh, of, of various kinds. That would certainly be one of the things that we and others would look at. And I say others because. This concern that China is considering providing lethal military assistance to, to Russia, this is a shared concern. And many other partners uh, have uh, raised this, and not just raised this with us, but, it's my understanding, have raised it directly with China, including here today in Delhi. To Maha Siddiqui with NDTV. <clears throat> Secretary Blinken, even though there's been an outcome statement and the chair summary, in two successive ministerial meetings, we've not seen consensus in the form of a joint communique. Do you see that as a setback in the run-up to the summit in September? And uh, were you perhaps able to communicate this uh, to your co Russian counterpart, uh, Sir Galavrov, when you met him on the sidelines today? So I think what we've seen here, as I, I mentioned, is actually a first, which is uh, an outcomes document uh, which um, reflects uh, shared agreements um, on a number of issues by all of the, uh, the foreign ministers represented here today. And in the particular case of um, Russia's war of uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine, uh, you have um, virtually everyone in the G20 signing on to what had already been stated in, in Bali. Uh, and the two holdouts, of course, for Russia. Uh, in China. 
So uh, I think we see broad consensus um, across the, uh, the G20 to um, work together, to act together, and to make commitments together. Uh, Prime Minister Modi said uh, today that we should not allow issues that we cannot resolve together to come in the way of those that we can. And I think what we saw today is a, a very good reflection of what the Prime Minister said. That is, uh, work and agreement on a whole series of lines of effort that the G20 will take to address the issues of greatest concern to people around the world. And that's been the focus of the United States. Uh, we want to make sure that even as we and dozens of countries around the world are standing up for the basic principles at the heart of the UN Charter that are uh, being trampled on by Russia and its aggression against Ukraine, we're at the same time also working every single day to address the concerns of people around the world uh, on the issues that are really affecting their lives, whether it is food insecurity, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's creating uh, economic opportunity, uh, building global health resilience, etc. All of those things uh, we've advanced on yet again here at the G20, and my full expectation is that when the leaders get together, uh, you'll see further very concrete outcomes uh, that reflect that consensus. Simon Lewis, Reuters. Thank you. Um, just to, uh, to follow up a little bit on, on, on what you just um, discussed on, on the G20 today, um, Prime Minister Modi also uh, you know, mentioned um, in, his, in his comments today that multilateralism is in crisis um, and talked about the architecture of global governance uh, having failed. I wonder if, if you agree with that, with that assessment. Um, and, and since the, the G20 failed once again to reach a consensus, you know, putting a slightly finer point on it, can this forum still function with uh, Russia as a member? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to add on your, your conversation with um, Foreign Minister Lavrov, I wonder why was it that you felt that this was the moment to raise those issues um, with the Foreign Minister? Thanks, Ian. Um, first, I'd say that, of course, uh, Prime Minister Modi is right, that there are real challenges to the multilateral system, <laughs> and those challenges in many ways are coming uh, directly from Russia, which uh, has been violating the very principles that lie at the heart of that system and that the system was designed to, uh, to uphold. Um, and so that is, a, that is a challenge. And we see that playing out as well, for example, at the United Nations Security Council, where um, we have uh, two countries in particular that tend to block uh, the attempted actions of the Council to address some of the most urgent global concerns. On the other hand, uh, what we've seen, I think, speaking very powerfully and eloquently, is the multilateral system in, um, in a variety of ways. Three quarters of it coming together at the UN General Assembly to condemn Russia's war of aggression against uh, Ukraine and to insist on a just and durable peace. That's the multilateral system. Uh, and we see it here today at the G20, thanks to uh, India's leadership, as I said uh, just a moment ago. Uh, even as we're focused on making sure that um, Russia can't succeed in its aggression against Ukraine, we're equally focused on engaging and solving problems that affect people around the world and that they expect us uh, to be focused on. Uh, and we're doing that through the G20, we're doing that through other multilateral organizations, uh, everything from the, the, the G7, uh, and uh, numerous other um, organizations, including other organizations that are within the UN system. And we're, we're, we're working together on food security, on energy security, um, on climate, on global health, and I think we're delivering results. So, all of this is to say that, yes, of course, there are real, there are real challenges. Uh, the Prime Minister is right. Uh, but I think we've demonstrated, including here today uh, in uh, Delhi, that we can find workarounds, and those workarounds, when we have an outlier, uh, can be found in the, uh, in the outcomes document that hopefully has been distributed to everyone. Uh, and again, it demonstrates real consensus and real commitment to work together to tackle issues that are affecting people in, in, their, uh, in their daily lives. And as I said a moment ago, I'm also convinced that um, when the leaders get together to finalize uh, some of these commitments, uh, you'll see very strong results. And again, 
from the pledge of the United States, this is exactly what our people expect of us and what the world expects of us. Suhasini Haider, the Hindu. Um, Secretary uh, Blinken, I wanted to just follow up on two of your answers already. You just said that you expect strong results when the leaders summit happens of the G20. Just how do you see that happening? How do you see the road ahead for the G20 process, given that now the document actually names Russia and China as holding up uh, the, the con consensus as well as not agreeing to the previous G20 uh, statement that they had signed on to? Uh, they say, of course, that they have their reasons for doing that. Uh, but do you really think a joint statement can be forged in the next few months? Do you think the G20 process itself is in peril? And if I could do a follow-up on Ian's question uh, about uh, the restrictions on a number of agencies, including NGOs, I wanted to ask specifically about restrictions on American agencies, uh, apart from climate change NGOs as well as human rights NGOs, specifically about funding restrictions placed on American agencies earlier like the Ford Foundation, but now like the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, the Center for Disease Control, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and others. Is that something that you've raised with your Indian counterparts? So, two things. First, uh, you're, uh, just to make sure that I understand, you're referring to restrictions that India would, place, would have placed on these organizations. Um, we've taken up these questions uh, in the past, and uh, we have... Um, discuss the uh, importance of NGOs and civil society uh, being able to function effectively uh, and freely wherever uh, they are uh, in our own country uh, and, uh, and here in India. So to the extent that issues have come up related to uh, NGOs, we've uh, discussed them directly with our, with our Indian counterparts. Uh, as to projecting to the uh, leadership, first of all, I don't want to spoil the show. Uh, we'll let the leaders um, do their work and show the results. But whether that's reflected in a joint statement, whether it's reflected in a chair statement that shows that the overwhelming majority of the G20 countries agreed to work together uh, on, a, on a course of action, um, honestly, I don't think that makes a, a, a big difference. If there are uh, going to be an, an outlier country or, or two, uh, when you have 18 of the 20, agreed on uh, what needs to be done and committed to working together to do it, again, that is uh, effective multilateralism in action, effective in actually addressing uh, the world's concerns. I think that's what you saw today, and I am absolutely convinced that you'll see that when the leaders get together one way or another. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.